This program is made possible in part by the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, one of America's top research universities, preparing students for today's interdependent world with internationally focused academic and outreach programs. The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Now, here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. For many refugees, reaching some measure of physical security comes at the cost of losing their identities. Their new status often means having their lives reduced to a case file. Financial and medical history, property deeds, education and professional credentials, work history, all become excess baggage that cannot be carried into their new lives. This process of severing refugees from their past impacts their ability to be successful going forward, setting up a dynamic of dependence. To maximize their ability to contribute and thrive in their new situations, they needed the ability to engage and participate as independently as they once did in their previous lives. Our guest today has a solution for this problem faced by stateless people worldwide. Hamza Warfa is a Somali-born former refugee and social entrepreneur. While working on strategies to address the marginalization of refugees and other displaced people from the economic life of their societies, he co-founded BankU a software technology company offering a blockchain solution to connect people to the global economy regardless of their present situation. Hamza, welcome to International Focus. Thank you so much, Doug. I'm very pleased to be here. Well, I wonder if you could start with uh, some sense of the scope of the refugee situation presently in the world. I mean, how many people are we talking about? Well, there are 67 million people around the world who are refugees and displaced due to war, uh, environmental reasons, and, uh, and generally displacement due to fear in their lives and who are on the go. And uh, more than half are under 18, isn't that correct? More than half are under 18, 45% uh, is uh, women, and uh, the average stay in refugee camps is uh, 17 years. Wow, so if, uh, if you're an 18-year-old and you're spending the next 17 years in a camp, that's a good chunk of your life. It's a good chunk and because life is about collection of activities and events, uh, it's a significant loss uh, for someone uh, to restart their life as they uh, move to another situation, whether it's another country or re being repatriated back to their country of origin. Uh, so it's a significant uh, global uh, challenge. Uh, the worst humanitarian, you know, crisis uh, since 1945 uh, is the refugee crisis, uh, which obviously uh, 67 million uh, people, you know, would be um, the 22nd uh, largest country in the world uh, if it was populated into a one country. Well, and of course, this is an issue that you have more than an academic interest in. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your story? Well, you know, I was born in Mogadishu, Somalia, and I think for many people, uh, Somalia is associated with uh, violence and famine and, and, and so forth. Uh, but the more uh, context, you know, contextualized Somalia that I was born and grew up with in the first 10 years of my life was Somalia that was really uh, very peaceful. Uh, I used to play soccer in my neighborhood and uh, in fact, what a lot of people don't know is that Somalia had the first democratic government in Africa in 1967 with one person, one vote. And the next country that followed suit was after 30 years. Uh, so the country was going uh, in an upper mobility. It was a house of the uh, Association of African uh, Union, which is now renamed as the African Union. Uh, and then when the war happened, uh, my family fled uh, from the civil war and we arrived in uh, the Dabravici camp. Many people might know that uh, the Dabravici camp uh, was a camp that was built for uh, 70,000 people, but uh, ended up being home for s over 600,000 people. So imagine facilities that was set up for 70,000 people uh, becoming a home for 600,000 uh, population. 
So uh, you, you've written elsewhere about this process of, of really severing identity in that process. So talk a little bit about what you mean by that. Yeah, so by means of context, just imagine if you lost your wallet. Uh, you lost every documentation that you had in your life. You lost your diploma, uh, your property uh, title and record. And then you find yourself in a new strange land uh, where uh, you are completely disconnected from the people, the places that you knew. And uh, because life is a collection of activities and events, uh, none of your history can, comes with you. So all the credentialing that you have accomplished in life, all the education you have received, the loans you have been paying back, the uh, financial institutions you have been dealing with, all of that is left, and so you have to start life from scratch. That is the situation that my family and I found ourselves when we moved to the Dab. Both of my parents were very successful uh, entrepreneurs, uh, but when we came to the Dab refugee camp, we became nobodies. Uh, in fact, our names did not even matter. Uh, my we had a number, and that statistical number is what we used to collect food and water. Uh, but beyond that, we didn't exist uh, in the global economy. But yet, you know, we were people who were very successful, uh, who have done, you know, uh, uh, had successful accomplishments in education and in life. You know, with my, you know, for my siblings, my parents. That is the situation that. 67 million people found themselves today where the history they had is completely uh, uh, not part of their life. And that has a huge, significant uh, 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 challenge. It uh, disempowers people. It uh, creates a, a source of, uh, it's a source of humiliation. Uh, there is no dignity when someone is reduced to a statistical number and that they don't have what constituted their life prior to being displaced. Um, so that's really the problem that we're uh, trying to address. Uh, but more broadly, there's 2.5 billion people around the world who cannot prove who they are. In other words, they don't have any identity. And if they do, in some instances, it's a multiple identity cards uh, where the identity is not connected. Um, so in the case of uh, refugees in the Dab, see a lot of things are happening to the refugee. Uh, so on one hand, an NGO is providing uh, health services, where another NGO is providing uh, micro loans, another NGO is providing education. Uh, but all of the data and all of these activities sit and stay with each individual organization. So it's a silo approach where the services and the things that matter to me and my record doesn't belong to me and, and they are not integrated. There is no triangulation even between the different entities and institutions that are providing much needed basic services to me. Uh, so uh, it's a source of humiliation. It's a way where people stay in poverty for so long uh, because as you can imagine, uh, if you don't have FICO score, if you don't have uh, Equifax, uh, if you don't, you know, uh, if you don't have any of these, you're basically non-existent. So you exist, but you don't really exist. Well, and uh, you know, I think we should underscore. Oftentimes, we have the image of of people in a refugee camp as a very short-term situation where maybe they they need assistance for a relatively brief period and then they move on with their lives. If you're in that situation for 17 years, there are all the other activities of a normal life that have to go on, right? And this is why the refugee delivery system needs to completely be transformed. Uh, the current system we have in place was meant to be temporary. Uh, it was uh, established after the 1945 uh, World War II. Uh, so, as you said, it was supposed to be a temporary basic service shelter, you know, provision. But when you're in a camp for 17 years or 20 years uh, and you are, multiple things are happening in your life, 
where, you know, recently I was in the DAP refugee camp where I spent three years and a half of my life. And I, some of the fascinating things I experienced was that uh, the cell phone penetration is remarkable. Uh, so I visited the same tents that I have lived for three years and a half. And the, the cell phone usage is, you know, uh, I would say in some areas, uh, some refugee camps, 60% cell phone usage. But get this, no electricity, no running water, but 60% cell phone usage. And I wondered, how do you charge your phones, right? I mean, that's the question that comes to your mind. So refugees sometimes use uh, uh, solar lights to charge their phone. They are connected to the social media. Many of them have Facebook. Uh, one of the experiences that uh, my co-founder and our CEO had in Zatari camp, Jordan, was when he connected with uh, refugee entrepreneurs. And, and they have been discussing about the idea of connecting to the global economy, providing services. Many of them uh, can do translation services. They sell cultural artifacts and things like that. But they don't have means to show digital their digital identity and work history. So that would seem sort of counterintuitive, uh, a term you just used of refugee entrepreneurs. I think we, we have the idea that you're, you're sitting in a tent hoping the next food is dispersed soon, but the idea that you could actually be an entrepreneur while you were in the camp. Yeah, there's, uh, there's you know, organizations uh, like Danish Refugee Council and, you know, there's Kiva. There's organizations that provide small loans to uh, refugees, recognizing that refugees are here for 17 years or more. Uh, so you see refugees that are running small businesses uh, in the refugee camp, uh, sometimes selling you know, things within the camp, uh, sometimes selling things to the host community in some instances. Uh, in the Dab refugee camp, I met uh, 20 women who had these passbooks where they collect you know, money from each other. And each month, one person gets it and you know, buy, you know, sells things. Uh, so they have a uh, high entrepreneurship, you know, uh, spirit. Uh, so they are entrepreneurial in mind and in spirit. Uh, they have the willingness to work, uh, and, but they are secluded from the society. They are disconnected from the global economy, in part because they don't have means of showing their record. The coffee that I'm drinking sometimes is produced by women in far places as far as Colombia or Congo or, or places like that. But yet, we don't trace this coffee to the women that made, who can really monetize that record, that history of producing coffee. And so our, uh, we created a platform uh, called uh, BankU app, uh, which provides, uh, our mission is to connect uh, refugees, women farmers, through, through the global economy. And so talk a little bit about where the name came from. So the name came from when uh, my co-founder, uh, Ashish Garnes, uh, visited in the Congo. Uh, Ashish and I met uh, through a project. We were working together uh, in the global development space. And uh, women who made $200 from her business uh, agriculture you know, harvests came to a bank. And she wanted to open a bank account. Uh, but the teller told her that, you know, I cannot bank you because, number one, uh, you're women. This is South Kivu and, you know, uh, some challenge, you know, that exists there. But secondly, it was very cost prohibitive. Uh, so my colleague uh, was very upset about that. And, you know, uh, the teller told, you know, I can, I can bank you, talking to Ashish, uh, my co-founder, but I cannot bank her. So my colleague told the women, one day we'll bank you. And that's where our name originally came from. Uh, for me, it's more than a professional work. It's been a personal. Uh, I've, all, I've been uh, involved in refugee immigrant empowerment and enablement uh, over the last 15, 18 years. And uh, so we, I could see, you know, we were exploring ways to empower people. And one of the things that is essential uh, from my perspective is dignity making sure that you can provide services to somebody, but if they don't feel dignified, they still don't believe they belong. Uh, the, prob uh, the problem really uh, is uh, persistent even across boundaries. So 
when refugees are resettled in the United States, for example, in Milwaukee or Minneapolis, the first thing they need to do is find an apartment. Well, to get an apartment rental, you need a credit history. Uh, so imagine if someone came with their record and say, you know what, when I was in the Dab refugee camp, I had 20 loans that I have received that I fully repaid back. I also got this education, you know, bachelor degree or high school diploma from this, you know, NGO or, you know, that provided to me uh, after I completed, you know, all the work. Uh, I've been receiving remittance money uh, from my social network, family members who are in the West or, you know, and so forth. So combining all these data points, provide a newly arrived refugee a head start a way to immediately connect because it takes about 10 years for refugee to get a credit score of 500 in the United States. That's a long time. So imagine someone coming with already an established history, a credit history, that they can start with their new life, and their new you know, uh, adopted country, and so forth. So it's a significant empowerment, not only in dignity, but also in connecting to the global economy. One of the stories I was just sharing uh, with someone uh, is that imagine, you know, I've been sending money to family members back home last 20 years. So imagine if my family member back home could show they have been receiving $400 from me consistently for every month over the last 20 years. That is a credit record that can be established for that individual, can be monetized that can allow somebody to get a rental apartment, that can allow someone to open a bank account, that can allow someone to find an employment, to get a car loan, and so forth. So it's a, it's a paradigm shift from the current refugee delivery system. So what was the, the confluence of, of technology that, that made this possible? I mean, the need had clearly been there for a very long time. Right, yeah, well, I think many people know uh, Bitcoin, so we don't deal with Bitcoin, but the technology that Bitcoin leverages is called blockchain. And blockchain is basically decentralized uh, distributed ledger, and it allows people to own their own data safely and securely rather than a centralized corporate control database where all of your data points are sitting in multiple different corporate controls, whether it's an NGO or government or this and that. Uh, the individual blockchain provides that opportunity to have a, what we call a permission network. So the individual owns their data and allows to build a network with their permission. So a refugee can allow UNHCR to be part of their network. It can allow, you know, the refugee council, uh, you know, and so forth, all the different service providers, a bank, you know, and so forth. Uh, so it, uh, it shifts, you know, someone from being a pity taker to someone who is an owner, an authorized uh, individual for others to use his or her data to empower them. And more importantly, establish a credit history that would allow them to build, a, uh, a connect to the global economy. So blockchain, you know, uh, has, a, you know, infinite use cases. We're using in the humanitarian space, we were selected by the uh, White House, I should say Obama White House, uh, on, uh, as an innovative solution to refugees. Uh, we also were selected by the uh, MIT Innovation uh, Award. We received the you know, MIT Innovation Award. We we're invested by Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, so we are a for-profit social enterprise. And our mission is to connect, you know, uh, millions of people to the global economy. Uh, we do uh, transparency, uh, supply chain transparency and traceability so that multinational corporations and groups like that are able to uh, trace, you know, and connect, meet their UN Sustainable Development Goals to make sure that, you know, they are not involved in uh, human trafficking, child labor law, you know, and so forth. Uh, but for refugees and immigrants, it's a significant empowerment. Uh, and so the technology, blockchain technology, uh, creates that opportunity of decentralization 
Uh, and uh, I say it's one of the six, you know, democratization, digitalization, demonetization, you know, uh, so it's part of this new movement. There's going to be, there will be uh, 1.5 billion people who are joining the global economy or who will have an online access in the next few years. And so blockchain is allowing people uh, to join this global economy by having a digital identity, which is a credentialing of a person's record history that is part of their identity. We call it economic passport. So how does it work at the individual level? I'm, I'm in Kenya, in Dadaab, in the camp, and I've heard about Banku, and I would like to take advantage of it. What would I do? It's a very simple process, uh, as the same way that someone would sign up you know, to LinkedIn or Facebook. You go to bankyup.com, uh, you sign up. Uh, if you are uh, illiterate, um, that's where uh, an intermediary organization, an NGO, can facilitate to make sure that you build up. And uh, we also have a patent pending uh, concept that, is, uh, that we call persona. And persona is basically, if you want to see my health record, and I don't want you to see my economic activity, I will have different set of phrases. So for example, if I say my shoes are black, you get my health record. If I say the sky is blue, you get my economic uh, development activities uh, to ensure that you know, uh, the data is uh, controlled by the owner and can share with ever you know they want to share with the best analogy i like to use is you know the fax machine uh, that my uh, other co-founder uses a lot you know which is the first fax machine was really useless because you need a second fax machine for it to work uh, so in this instance by connecting by creating an account and connecting with someone you start building the network so all you need is that first to uh, so uh, for diaspora members this is a way to uh, meet, know your customer, you know, by, for the banks, so that you're able to uh, use remittances online. Uh, the average cost for uh, the diaspora member to send money back home is anywhere between 12 to 18 percent, if you use Western Union and you know, in groups like that. But because this uh, blockchain empowerment, banks can use uh, bank you platform as a KYC solution, uh, which reduces the cost, brings more efficiency, and obviously uh, reduces the cost for the individual that's sending the money. Uh, so it's a real empowerment. It's a new innovation. Uh, and it, the idea has been validated. Um, and we have over 25,000 users already in the system. Uh, we are one of the very few companies that are have already uh, post our post production, have uh, paying customers. We don't charge refugees, uh, women farmers. The service is free to them, uh, and we generated our uh, revenue uh, through working with the multinational companies, banks, international NGOs, who are either interested in the supply chain transparency uh, and traceability solution the KYC solution, know your customer solution for banks, NGOs that are looking for 360 view of, um, uh, uh, of, of their customer or client. So uh, give us an example of, of what kinds of activities you've seen. I mean, what, what sorts of, of connections are the refugees making to the global economy? Yeah, so uh, examples uh, include, you know, uh, individuals who are monetizing the relationship they have with their family members back home. So if I give you an example of a scenario, um, imagine if I send money you know, to my nephew, let's just say who lives in Lagos. So I send $1,500 to him, he buys a Uber-like surface, but motorcycle. So every time he drives this motorcycle, he's now independent you know, and not relying on the $200 or $400 that I'm sending. And every ride he makes, because he, he's using the BankQ platform, he's building tra transaction history. So six months from there, he can go to a car dealer and say, look, I am credit worthy. This is how many rides I do. This is how much money I make. And 
I have my uncle in the US who sends me this amount of money consistently. Uh, so you have shifted that individual's uh, life from one of dependence to one of independence, one of dignity where they now empowered themselves, where they are working independently, earning income, and that is made possible by this platform that allows you to build a transaction history. If you are a woman farmer and you need a tractor you know, to, uh, loan to get, to, to buy a loan, uh, sorry, loan to get a tractor, and instead of being charged 40% because we don't know the level of risk you, know, you bring, I can say, look, this is how much coffee I've been producing the last four years, and you know, this is the consistent income I've been making from it. It reduces the cost of borrowing significantly. Well, it's fascinating stuff. I'm very happy you could be with us. Hamza Warfa, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. To our viewers, we'll see you next time on International Focus. program is made possible in part by the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, one of America's top research universities, preparing students for today's interdependent world with internationally focused academic and outreach programs.